Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to another entry in the Backward Compatible Player Codex. I am Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, hey. And we are going to be discussing Titan's Grave, The Ashes of Alcana, um, which we have mentioned several times before on the podcast, and we uh, we both have very much enjoyed, um, or at least I enjoyed, I don't know about you necessarily, Doc. <laughs> oh, no, I enjoyed it very much. Cool. And for those who may not know, this is uh, Will Wheaton's thing. Yes. Um, Will Wheaton and company... Um, it is published by Geek and Sundry, the YouTube channel, slash... Um, they have their own website, of course. And they would actually uh, post up the new episodes that they came out on Tuesdays on their uh, on geekandsundry.com first, and then on YouTube on Fridays. Um, and so if you wanted it to their website, you can get access to it early. Uh, but all that aside, we wanted to discuss it. Um, one, because when you've spent um, 8 to 10 hours with something you enjoy, you kind of feel like talking about it. Um, well, that's true. You also are we also um, find it relevant to our interests because uh, we do a lot of discussions about tabletop role playing games. Um, we talk about um, things like GMing and playing role playing games, and we also, of course, run our own show that's somewhat along these lines. Uh, roll with it, uh, where we do um, in an audio format as opposed to a video format, um, actual play tabletop role playing games. Um, and we try to tell stories in much the same way that they kind of do here. Um, of course, we are uh, we are amateurs, and we don't have nearly the budget that they do, nor the uh, star power. But well, we're professional amateurs, and that's what makes the difference. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, no, we just we, uh, I, I personally found, uh, as I said, that it was a really cool show, um, and we wanted to sort of uh, come and do a sort of in depth analysis of their approach to it because it has become something of. Um, you know, more and more people are now starting to think of it as a thing that can be shown to non-role players to get them into tabletop role-playing games. Um, I definitely think that just like tabletop did that for a lot of board games, this is going to start to do that for role-playing games. Um, and so I think it's definitely worth discussing in that regard. Um, so without further ado, I say we go in and uh, hop right into it and begin our critical analysis, which, by the way, does not necessarily mean that we are coming at it uh, to be critical. Um, critiquing and critical analysis simply means that it is um, fairly objective, um, looking at all angles. Um, you know, it, those of you in academia will understand, but some people hear cr- uh, critic and think that it only means just bashing, as the uh, as the internet likes to call them, haters. Uh, we are not haters. We are, in fact, fans of the show, but we are um, approaching it also as academics who are interested in studying a thing. Absolutely right. So. Shall we begin? Let's do. Um, I guess we should probably start by talking about the setting. All right. So Titan's Grave is an original setting that they made for the show. Um, The world of Volcana is where the whole thing takes place. And it is... uh, The the system they run, which we'll get to a little bit later on, is the Fantasy Age system, Age standing for Adventure Game Engine, which is something that is published by um, Green Ronin Press and uh, has been used in other games before. I know for sure it was used in the Dragon Age RPG, the tabletop RPG. Right. Um, and I think it was also used, or at least a version of it was used, in the uh, Song of Ice and Fire role-playing game, um, which is, of course, the um, series of books behind Game of Thrones. That sounds right. When they were releasing Fantasy Age, which was their, uh, you know, generically fantasy, but a generic system um, based on that engine, they tweaked a few things from the Dragon Age game in order to make it um, not specifically Dragon Age, but something that you can apply to a whole number of different fantasy settings, including this, where they decided to not just make it fantasy, but to make it fantasy sci-fi. That's right. Um, or if you look at it from the perspective of the sci-fi channel, it's uh, S-Y-F-Y, mm. as they changed their, uh, what is that, logo, mm-hmm. acronym to be about five years ago. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, they did that intentionally, so they would no longer be the science fiction channel, they would actually be the science fantasy channel. mm mm-hmm. um, interesting reactions to that one Mm -hmm. but i would say that the ashes of volcana that is to say titan's grave Mm -hmm. firmly entrenched in that sci fantasy Mm -hmm. type of world it's also an apocalyptic world yeah technically Mm -hmm. um it has a rich history in the sense that it um had sort of i guess it was an alien invasion technically um yeah i suppose so it was more um that aliens seeded life on the planet, which is, of course, you know, one of the many theories around uh, how life came to uh, begin here on Earth was the idea that um, how does life to sort of like 
the, the conditions for life are so precise that how could we have possibly just randomly have it happen? And some people think it's like, oh, well, some uh, living organism landed on Earth through a meteor or something like that. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily that Earth itself birthed life, that life sort of arrived on Earth. But Hen spermia, mm-hmm. as seen in the video game Spore. Yeah. There you go. Um, and so in this case, of course, it was that an intelligent race of ancients dropped what would then seed life on this planet. Um, so it's a little bit more direct in that sense. But it's totally okay that they evolve naturally, mm-hmm. right, on their yeah. own home world, because mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, they had to come from somewhere, too. Well, right? that, <laughs> we're suddenly talking about the origins of yeah. all life. Well, let's, uh, let's not get a, let's not deviate. We'll save that for a different... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the other thing that was interesting about it, too, from my perspective, was the fact that they did blend um, science fiction and fantasy, uh, kind of almost like a traditionalist um, D&D style fantasy um, where they're kind of allowed because they had both technology and magic they could really do whatever they wanted <laughs> yeah um, they could have swords and they could have guns and they could have wizards and they can have scientists um, and basically anything that you need to explain away um, you know sort of like you know sci-fi tech it away or fantasy magic it away you could do both yeah, swords so, and blasters. Yeah, exactly. as as our friend Kevin, who is the GM of season three, uh, is fond of saying. Mm-hmm. But uh, of roll with it. Of roll with it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Of, of our of our season three of roll with which it. I don't think we've actually announced until now. So. No, we haven't. There you so. go. So those of you uh, listening to this uh, get the first announcement of uh, season three of roll with it, which we will talk about more in that's depth. That's right. Time. See, you should listen to everything that we put out because we hide spoilers and uh, teasers mm-hmm. and Easter eggs in everything. Speaking of spoilers, in case um, in case there's any doubt, uh, spoiler alert for this, we are definitely spoiling a lot. Um, but a lot of what we're going to talk about what really won't make sense unless you've seen the series anyway. Um, so if you haven't seen Titan's Grave, go watch it and then come back. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, I like this world. I really do. I think that there's a right and a wrong way to do science fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, I will cite as the correct way to do it the Shining series, um, Shining Sword, mm. Shining in the Darkness was actually the the original original, which was a dungeon crawl in the truest sense. Um, and then like Shining Force and some of the other ones. Th- these are old Sega games. And you're playing a fantasy very... Final Fantasy type fantasy and what you discover as you go along is that the apocalypse happened and it's so long ago people forgot about it Mm -hmm. and before that it was a highly advanced technological society and that the root of all magic in the world actually comes from this forgotten technology and it reminds me of sort of the Arthur C. Clarke quote which I will um, paraphrase Mm -hmm. by saying any sufficiently advanced technology is going to come across as uh, magic Mm -hmm. To those who do not understand it. Right. And I think that there's an element of that in Titan's Grave, which mm-hmm. comes across very well, and it comes across um, in, a, in a way that at first I was a little nervous about, mm-hmm. because if you do it wrong, what you've opened up is, we can do anything, and because we can do anything, it'll, you'll like it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you, oh, you like fantasy? You'll like it. You like mm-hmm. sci-fi? You'll like it. You mm-hmm. like apocalyptic? You, you'll like it. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think that um, they did a very good, a smart thing, and they did a very good job of actually doing a lot of world building before they started the series. Yeah, that's true. Um, They established um, the history of the world. um, They established the societies of the world. They established the rules of the world, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, So that by the time they actually got to playing, at least in the GM's mind, um, if not necessarily in the players uh, or in the audiences, they sort of understood what does and does not happen in this world, despite the fact that because they have both magic and technology, they can really make whatever they want to happen. That's right. Well, and I think that the opening sequence is actually very good. It's the, you know the little twenty thirty second um, opener that says, "Oh, this is what happened, and here it is." And yeah. uh, the the phrase "ashes of Volcana refers to the that, that apocalypse which did occur, mm. and how the technology is still around, but it's a remnant kind of a thing. And you can tell that all of society is fractured. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the giant, um, the chaos wars that happened, um, who the prophet Dewan, who's this ancient, um, villain and later becomes kind of the, uh, focal point of the conflict, um, throughout this season, um, was basically splitting the world into two with this belief that the merging of science and magic, 
or magic and technology specifically, um, was an abomination and that um, society basically needed to be purged and returned to a more natural, magical state. Right. Um, which, in a way, is, uh, of course, sort of allegorical to, um, you know, supernaturalism and or religion versus kind of the, like, the, the idea that there is a divide between um, people who are religious and people who are scientific and as if that can't be um, th- those are mutually exclusive and they can't coexist. Right. Well this is um, a 21st century theme for sure. I yeah. think that very successful stories that are remembered mm-hmm. 200 years from now are going to mm-hmm. be the ones that addressed this idea mm-hmm. as we, you know, the human race came upon this moment where we either irreversibly damaged our planet mm-hmm. or we found a way to uh, coexist and respect that force of nature, which mm-hmm. we are so superior to. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, that's something that's definitely a theme in Titan's grave is the idea that, um, the, there is a, a coexistence of magic and technology and there are, um, magical technologies that, that are used. There are, um, people like one of the main characters is in fact a cyborg, um, right. who, you know, couldn't be alive, let alone fighting if it wasn't for the cybernetic enhancement. So, you know, even in that one character, there's this um, this merging of the natural with the technological. Exactly. So, yeah, the, the setting's very strong, and it lends itself to the story, which, of course, is seen through the lens of the four main characters, mm-hmm. and I guess also through the GM, mm-hmm. who is Will Wheaton. Right. And it's worth mentioning that he had a co-writer which is something that you and I have also done. Our season one of Roll With It mm-hmm. was uh, co-written between you and me. I GM'd it, right. but uh, I couldn't have done it without your input. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it became what it became because of that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, if you want to hear more about that process, we actually just recently put up our post-mortem, post-mortem on the Eden program, uh, also available on backwardcompatible.com. Yeah, and that, that was a really fun episode to do mm-hmm. um, in the Codex just because we had recorded so much of the meta stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I really would like to hear some of the meta stuff for Titan's Grave. I mm-hmm. hope that it gets released. Mm-hmm. And um, there actually is a little bit already. I know you and I both watched the um, the recording of the panel they did at the San Diego Comic Con. That's right. Um, That's worth a listen if you're a fan of mm-hmm. Titan's Grave, Definitely. which you probably are if you're listening to this. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, yeah. So the four the four main characters were um, uh, Limley, who was played by Laura Bailey. Um, it was Sleth. I don't know how many K's are you're actually supposed to pronounce. Well, there's a parentheses. Yeah. Uh, so you no no not what, what am I trying to say? An apostrophe. An apostrophe. There's an, there's an apostrophe and, and a couple of K's at the end. Yeah. So, there you go. Um, so. But he is a uh, half orc, half Saurian um, wizard or mage. Or yeah, I don't but know. who isn't? I yeah. <laughs> um, Saurians, of course, being the uh, the lizard people of this world. Dinosaur people. Um, I don't know if I'd call them dinosaur people. It's the root, man. It's got to be. Mm, maybe. I mean, come on. Dinosaur means terrible thunder lizard. I suppose that's true. Think about it. <laughs> um, so there's... Uh, and he was played by um, Yuri Lowenthal, uh, who is an actor. Um, and then there was Kiliel, a rogue um, half-dwarf, half-elf, uh, half-elf, played by um, Allison Hayslip. And then Hank Green played a full-blooded Saurian named Ankia, who had a little robot companion named Jeremy. So... yeah. I found it interesting that even though there were two men and two women players, mm. there were actually three female characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because one of them was, um, I guess, an alien race, mm-hmm. I didn't actually catch that until halfway through. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of interesting until it <laughs> yeah, became narrative. All, all the illustrations, like, yeah. you might be able to tell just by looking. Yeah, so. well, you know, they weren't wearing skirts or anything. Mm-hmm. They were wearing battle armor. So yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. So that was pretty cool, I thought. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the role of Jeremy was played, or Jeremy the Little Companion Robot was played by Will because it was an NPC. Right. Um, which, that was one of the, actually the big, the big draws for me, not just because I was a fan of Tabletop before Titan's Grave came out, um, but because when I saw who the cast was, um, it's all, you know, actors or people who, you know, in Hank's case, he's not necessarily an actor, but he is a performer, and he does have a lot of experience, um, you know, presenting himself through his video blogs and stuff like that. So it's not like he doesn't know how to um, sort of perform. Yeah, Will Wheaton should have been an actor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. I think he is. Oh, oh, um, okay. And so you have an actor GMing it, uh, not just an actor, but a very experienced uh, right. GM 
uh, as we'll talk about later. But um, and he knows his way about uh, around sci-fi and geek stuff too. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, wow. Uh, and then you know a cast of four people who are performers mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. who you know most of them have some improv experience. Um, it lends itself very well to role play. So that's right. Um, it, it's not just like a couple of a few dudes like us who just sort of got together one day and decided to record ourselves playing role playing games. Hey, we're not just dudes. We're stuffy ap- academics. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So so, uh, but you know, take it take take it as you will. Uh, it, it's people who um, know what they're doing as far as portraying characters, and I think that that actually adds a, a really great um, uh, dynamic to the to the show. That's true, actually. I- if you were going to hand pick who would do well in this sort of a presentation thing, I think that I think they chose well. Mm-hmm. Um, regardless, the story itself is about these four heroes who are apparently descendants of um, the the ancient heroes of old, the ones mm-hmm. that the tales are told mm-hmm. of, who, from who helped end the chaos wars, right? From the chaos wars, mm-hmm. the the ones who. Um, dealt with the prophet and mm-hmm. did all of this and sealed her away mm-hmm. and, and this and that. And they have to learn their history, um, you know, their family histories, I guess. And mm-hmm. they actually end up uh, going to, like, an ancient mansion and all kinds of things that, that really clue in. And, th- and that's a fun discovery process mm-hmm. whenever you feel like the characters have a purpose for being there. some One of the questions you and I asked early on, mm-hmm. and literally you just looked over on the other side of the couch and said, hey, what if, yeah. how are, and, yeah. and, and it was about, are these characters going to become rich mm-hmm. narratively? Mm-hmm. Are they going to become significant narratively? In other words, what makes them so significant? Is mm-hmm. it just that they're the PCs? Yeah, and that, that's something that comes up a lot in, like, not necessarily the show, but just in role-playing in general, yeah. games in general, yeah. where, um, you know, the, the, this is a ragtag group of people that came to know each other um, because they are a traveling group of performers, mm-hmm. basically. Um, they've all got, you know, pretty interesting backstories, but they're still just kind of, like, normal, down-on-their-luck people, which is not an uncommon story for, like, you know, the 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 ordinary person to be given um, extraordinary um, abilities or powers or whatever and then go and save the world. Right. Um, so in a sense it's sort of following a very familiar format but at the same time that format sometimes bugs me because um, it's like just because you're the player party um, you're going to go from zero to hero and you're going to be the ones who go and like you know slay the dragons and take down the evil wizard and like do all these things that like all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't do. Right. You know just because you're the player characters. Well and you know it's interesting because in in fiction, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's this element which is called the denial of the call, and it's an important stage if mm-hmm. we're talking about um, Joseph Campbell and, right. and Monomyth. Mm-hmm. It's a very important stage because it's that moment where Bilbo is going, uh, "No, I'm just a little hobbit. I don't want adventuring. Thank you very much." Mm-hmm. And then at the last moment, changes his mind and rushes out of his door and forgets mm-hmm. his hanky as he does so. Mm-hmm. And we never get that in role play because we we sort of pick up at the moment after that has already occurred and you assume that the refusal to the call if it ever happened happened before we began playing Mm -hmm. or else we wouldn't be um we wouldn't be playing Mm -hmm. it and and there's a conceit there and And there's something to be said for that too it's something that um the fate system has built into it where they assume that the characters you're going to be playing and fate being a another role-playing system entirely um by evil hat productions um and one that we rather enjoy Mm -hmm. They have assumptions about the characters that your characters are um, competent and they're proactive and there was something else too. Um, but the the idea being that they aren't the type that are going to you know refuse the call to adventure. Right, yeah. They are the ones who are going to go out and do things because that's what you do in role playing games. You go out and you do things. That's exactly right. Um, but that being said, you know sometimes I feel like, and especially because this story very quickly starts to take on something of an epic scale, and we'll sort of get to that here in a yeah, little yeah. while. But um, you know, like so this little ragtag group of people suddenly like just because they help out you know the beer baron um you know stop uh, his caravan band from getting raided um you know a few episodes later they're summoned by this big uh this big big wig in a much larger city to um go and do this like hugely important the fate of you know the world quest it's like why are these guys just yeah. because they're the player party um and as we find out later on um there actually is um there are some interesting reasons for it, and there's a big reveal near the end that, to me, really justifies um, 
the this like nobody group of players and of course you come to appreciate them you get to see their skills and stuff like that um throughout the course of the story they take on a more a greater sense of importance just because of familiarity yeah um well but, let, let's just talk about it i mean yeah, it's good. it's the fact that they are the descendants of those great mm-hmm. heroes and so you know my my sort of thought and it's not explicitly stated but it's pretty much implied that they are summoned by this guy Voss, who is this extremely ancient elf who is basically kept alive only through this uh, magitech, if you will, yeah. um, on like this hospital bed that's got like this little uh, magical dome around him. He projects um, himself as a hologram. Yeah, which I thought that was a neat touch. Yeah, that was, that was a really cool touch. Um, but he summons these heroes up there, and you, you sort of you take away that they're the ones who have to go because they are descended from these heroes, and there's like this thing where they have to, uh, you know, lend the blood of the heroes and that sort of stuff in order to unlock these things that allow them to then continue with their quest. Um, And so, like, I felt like, especially in that episode, um, aside from the fact that they were getting paid to go do the thing, um, and even though they did kind of, to to a certain extent, like, ask why us, it was never really answered why them. Um, You know, it was basically, it almost just felt to me like, kind of like, oh, yeah, it's because you're the player party, you know? Right. Um, But later on, we find out that, you know, that that was important, their descent was important, but also, um, spoiler alert once again, at the very end of the series, um, they kill the Prophet Dewan, which basically they're sent there to go do that because um, evil is awakening again and Mm -hmm. is causing all this Mm -hmm. bad stuff to happen. So basically, you have to take her out and her weakened state so that the world can be saved from this, like, second coming of all the evil stuff. Yeah. Um, Which apparently Voss was into, Mm because he sent him to go do it. Yeah. And Um, it doesn't work out well. Yeah. And so they they kill her, and it turns out that basically they wanted her to be killed because um, she would then reawaken, or be reborn, and become more powerful than he could ever imagine. Uh, Hugh, uh, Obi-Wan. So, in that sense, one, their lineage, and two, essentially their... Um, naivete was what was important in making them the choice to go and do the thing. And I think that right there, for me, um, justified the otherwise um, sort of tropey and nonsensical story of nobody's doing this great deal. Yeah. It reminded me of Sauron, actually, Mm -hmm. and how he was trying to restore his power, and it took a nobody to defeat him. Because it was unexpected, mm-hmm. um, so this is this is good storytelling in that sense. I think um, understanding that we appreciate heroes who are underdogs, and that's really what we got. Um, it's just the irony was that they they were tricked. Setting it up for the second season, mm-hmm. which uh, I don't know, I felt a little bit that it was a little bit of a um, uh, a switch. Mm-hmm. Oh, what, what's what's the what's the phrase that I'm looking for bait here? And bait and switch. That's mm. it. It felt a little bit like a bait and switch mm. because it was like, look, you beat the thing, and then the then the voice comes, mm. and and I get that, um, you know, the whole the whole thing was to set it up for that second one. Mm-hmm. But I hope that there is an intended ending. Mm-hmm. I think there is, um, and because with the same, my understanding is basically around the same time they announced. I think it was a Gen Con, maybe something else. But they had a panel and they announced that they did plan to do a second season of Titan's Grave. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think they also said that they intend to make it a five-season arc. Um, cool. So apparently there is an ending in mind. Nice. Um, or at least a vague sense of an ending. Well, when you're talking about something that has ten episodes, though, that's mm-hmm. not a normal structure. Because mm-hmm. they're not bound by um, the, the release numbers. They're mm-hmm. not even bound by time constraints. Right. Some of them are, you know... 40 minutes, some of them are an hour. Mm-hmm. Some, some more like 35-ish. Yeah, yeah. A, a, which is the nature of the internet and mm-hmm. sort of releasing in that way. So some of the old models that we have, the expectations that we have from a uh, highly, heavily produced show that would air on TV, mm-hmm. not bound by that, which makes it for a level of authenticity that I think mm-hmm. is really cool. And actually that's a pretty good segue, I think, into... The, um, the GMing style and the story structure. Because I have a feeling yeah. that they did plan ahead to a certain degree with here's what's going to happen in episodes 1 through 10, mm-hmm. um, generally speaking. Because you can sort of tell as they play that Will's GMing style, which again I think is very good, um, is more of a traditional um, tabletop style. Whereas you and I, we tend to like more of the modern, indie, open-ended um, 
more sort of improvisational yeah, stuff. Yeah, the oddball stuff, like mm-hmm. we've done two podcasts on exactly. with Brian. Um, and so it com- he kind of comes from a school of thought, or I, I imagine such, that the GM does a lot of prep work ahead of a campaign to prepare all these encounters and to prepare um, all these characters you're going to be running into and all these locations you're going to be coming across. Yeah. Um, so that when you run the game, it essentially, in a way, feels like you're playing... Um, you know, a video game that was sort of pre-planned, where you know, first the player is going to go through this town, and they're going to go to go, they're going to go into this dungeon, and then this thing is going to happen in the story. So it kind of feels like a pre-planned experience, a linear experience, and that definitely comes across in Titan's Grave. Not to say that um, there aren't moments when he improvises uh, details about like what they see in a room or what an unexpected character might say to them. Right. There's a little bit of improv built into any role-playing, game. and there should be. I yeah. mean. I, I kind of gloss over, my eyes sort of gloss over whenever he gets into, and, and this is anybody, when when you get into this pre-written script, mm-hmm. and because there's a difference between reading, even if you're reading dramatically, mm-hmm. and coming up with something off the top of your head based on a bulleted mm-hmm. set of points and a kind of general flow. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, I think Wheaton's a great GM. Yeah. Um, we know a lot of role players, we know a lot of GMs, we've played a lot of games, we've played a lot of systems. We've designed our own systems. All GMs are not created equal. Yep. Um, you know, you've got to have the right GM with the right system with the right group mm-hmm. in order for something to work. And mm-hmm. if you don't have those three things sort of in alignment, mm-hmm. um, short of, of even uh, being able to get through the first session well mm-hmm. <laughs> without some kind of a party wipe or, mm-hmm. or just not having fun... Mm-hmm. Being able to continue a campaign or a story or whatever mm-hmm. long enough to really enjoy it, really tell that story well, mm-hmm. and then further be actually good enough to to produce into a show. These are the things that we constantly mm-hmm. are thinking about, and I'm very, very pleased with the group we've got, mm-hmm. with the systems we've got, and with the GMs that we're using, myself included, because mm-hmm. I haven't always... Uh, I haven't always been able to GM the way that I do now. Right. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, and I think that just to kind of close that thought and, and circle back around to what we said before, having someone who is such an alpha geek mm-hmm. and so very good at what he does, mm-hmm. um, nobody else could have run it the way that mm-hmm. Wheaton ran it. And I think that it worked well for their show because you know it is an actual production. They had a crew who was only there for so many hours a day. They had a an, a window of I think it was like four days, maybe five days, mm-hmm. with which to set up their characters. I think they did a little bit of stuff ahead of time too, like you know talking about how their characters can be set up, but actually getting there and sort of getting established um, before starting the campaign proper. Um, there were um, definite like production realities they had to deal with, and they talk about that a bit on their uh, their panel. Um, but I think that. Given that they had to deal with that, and because it was such a high end production, there was a lot of artwork that went into it. There was a lot of, um, you know, editing that went into it. All this different stuff. Um, they had a budget. They had to sort of come into it with a sense of we know the story we're going to be telling. Mm-hmm. Even if like there are some like cool little emergent details that come out, like with any role playing game, um, we need to go into this knowing essentially here is our planned story arc. Um, and so you can tell that that comes across. And they're like you know they're little details like while they're playing where. Um, they go through, say, a lava tube, and then they know that, um, okay, there's going to be a heat trap here, so I've already planned ahead that you're going to be rolling, you know, 3d6 uh, damage because of the heat, that sort of thing. Right. That's stuff that, like, you could come up with ahead of time, but to me, it felt like throughout the series that it was planned. No, it's very natural. Mm-hmm. I mean, I never heard Will Wheaton uh, slip on a, on a player name as opposed to the character name. He He was very good at that mm-hmm. sort of mechanical type stuff mm-hmm. then again it could have been edited out we don't know mm-hmm. um, we, we do know that they basically played a single episode for three-ish hours or so and then trimmed it all down into the 40 45 minute episodes you see um, which is actually another one of the reasons I like this show versus other um, actual play type shows where they take essentially um, you know another geek and sundry um, show for instance is critical role where it's another one where they have a bunch of actors who get together and they play D and D, but they um, they do it live and they actually will stream the entire three hour session, mm-hmm. which can be really entertaining. But for me personally, I find it 
I, I don't like sitting there for that long, especially during action sequences when right. they're talking about I'm going to move here and roll to hit and roll to deal damage and like all sort of like mechanical talk and stuff like that mm-hmm. that happens. I know some people really get into that because um, it's a very popular show from what I understand, but it doesn't really appeal to me the same way that Titan's Grave does because Titan's yeah. Grave streamlines the experience and does, to a greater extent, sort of bring the narrative to the forefront. Well, you used exactly the right word. It is produced. It's mm-hmm. heavily produced. Yes. To the point where there are visualizations, there's art, mm-hmm. there's sound effects, there's all kinds of things like that. And an actual play is going to just be, let's hit record and let's not edit out much at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we were to compare to some of the other shows that are out there, um, we could talk about ours and we could say it's the difference between Roll With It, which we try to produce, mm-hmm. and also Roll With It Unplugged, mm-hmm. which we pretty much leave as is. Yeah, we, we trim a bit, but... Um, yeah, we, we definitely leave in a lot more than we would leave in with Roll With It. Right. Um, and, and another one that we've um, been in contact with recently is the uh, podcast that... Uh, the One Shot Podcast. The One Shot Podcast, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, what they do is, again, it's a lot of actual play with some trimming and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of it has to do with audience taste. Yeah. Um, what it is you're looking for as an audience mm-hmm. member. There's a fundamental problem built into all of this, and that is that the medium, by its definition, of role play is intended to be an interactive medium. And right. Anytime we record it, whether that be visually or just with audio, mm-hmm. we're, we're committing it into a, a format that is um, immutable. It's mm-hmm. unchangeable at that point. The interactivity is gone. Yeah. Um, and so, at least in the ability to change the story and things like that. And so... There, there are layers that come into play where, yeah, I'm watching this to see the story that's being told, but I'm also watching it because I'm interested in the characters. And I guess uh, highly related to that is the players who are playing those characters because right. they are coming through. As well as, I just really like this GM and I really like his narrative voice and mm-hmm. um, that sort of a thing. But what we're really talking about, um, if if I'm going to use the the lingo from the biz, Mm -hmm. is narrative mode. Mm -hmm. We're shifting from a third-person type of format, or I should say shifting, we're we're shifting into a third-person type of format from what is essentially a second-person format or arguably first-person format. And, And so what that means is instead of saying, you are doing this, what do you do? It's now... Um, he has done this. Let's see his reaction. Uh-huh. And so there are things that as a player, like going to town, negotiating with a um, shopkeeper and getting a deal that are actually highly, highly interesting for someone who is doing it because they're in control of it. and They right. have that, that moment of success. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we were to start a movie and spend the first 20 minutes of a movie with them buying stuff to go on their journey... Uh, we'd probably walk out of the theater. Yeah, I mean, it would, it just wouldn't go well. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, they did have at least one episode where they kind of had that um, town hub go around and shop thing and explore and talk to people. But it came like three or four episodes in. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the first thing they did, which I thought was a good choice. And it was a characterization episode too, yeah. so it worked because yeah. it was we were actually discovering. A lot of fun. I like that episode. I like that episode too. We we were discovering about the the amulet, mm-hmm. Limley's amulet, things mm-hmm. like that. Um, and she was my favorite character, yeah, so yeah. Um, I really liked that backstory and the things that happened. She became a cyborg because of an explosion mm-hmm. that uh, was caused by her yeah. killing her parents. I mean, oof, dark stuff, yeah, heavy yeah. stuff. They didn't, they didn't safety pad that at mm-hmm. all. And this is something that the the casting crew has talked about, you know, in panels and stuff like that, where um, they found it interesting that um, everything about Titan's Grave, the the world itself is broken and kind of fractured and the characters are broken and kind of fractured. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the story thematically is about kind of broken people trying to heal. Um, And I think that that, that's a really good sort of um, narrative, a a good narrative driving force um, that carries throughout the whole season that I really really enjoyed. I think gave it a lot of good um, depth that you wouldn't get from um, your your typical uh, kick the door in, kill the thing, take the right. sort of role playing experience. Setting wise, the whole world was broken. I yeah, mean, it was literally in recovery from a, a grand apocalypse war type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the the visualizations and the heavy production and that sort of thing, there's an irony that's embedded in that though. And it for me, it came down to uh, episode zero, mm-hmm. which if um, 
if there's anybody out there who, who watched the series but did not watch episode zero, recommend it because it, it really came across as Will Wheaton's manifesto for role play. Mm-hmm. And when you understand that, it helps to understand some of the decisions narratively that were made. Right. Um, but he actually talks about how everyone's seeing it differently in their head. Mm-hmm. And what I found kind of ironic about the heavily produced um, Titan's Grave videos Mm -hmm. that we saw is that there was art. Mm -hmm. There were even grids laid down Mm -hmm. and visualizations of for fizz repping, mm-hmm. for you know, physically representing. No, I think the grid though is more just kind of like for a kind of a sci-fi UI sort of thing. That's true. Um, because That's true. even even um, the actual system, Fantasy Age, doesn't use a grid. Right, it's all description based. That's and a good so point. They weren't even using a grid when they played. It was just description. That that visualization was there. I think more to um, relate it to to keep us all gameplay. on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and to be fair, I liked. Th- the art. I liked the visualization. Mm-hmm. I, I I thought it was well done. Mm-hmm. It did not detract any, it, mm-hmm. and it added some things, and mm-hmm. it and it made me go, oh, that's mm-hmm. what they're talking about right. in certain moments and that I, might be confusing. I think but, too, like I, I enjoyed the aesthetic of the world a lot, and I think in oh, another way, it also yeah. helps because it's um, it goes along with the source book that you can now go and buy. That right. is the Titans of Grave Ashes Volcana um, source book for Fantasy Age. Yeah. If you want to go and play in that world. Um, it, it, I, I, my understanding is that they had some concepts that the the people were seeing for their own characters mm-hmm. um, from the artists and stuff like that to because they the, the players and the the artists worked together to develop these characters um, and so they saw some of those but I don't think they saw you know in the moment they didn't get to see any of the things that we no saw. they did not and so basically in that sense I didn't mind them because they were after the fact it's an illustration. Um, for us as the audience watching what is now a produced, right. non-interactive form. Right. And it's an um, acknowledgement of that. It's a little bit of a conceit that mm-hmm. I think was was a fair trade. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, I, I really liked what it ended up being, and I don't think that I missed, let's call it the the two and a half hours that was cut out mm-hmm. for every half hour that we had. No, I definitely didn't miss that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's something that... You know, and, and this is even something with Roll with it too, where you know when we edit our episodes down, we we don't spend as much time because we, we do have less mechanical talk that happens just because of the systems we use. Right. Um, we choose them intentionally for that. Yeah. But what ends up happening with us is we'll take something that's maybe fifty minutes to an hour and turn it into about thirty or forty. That's right. Um so there is a lot of stuff that does get trimmed out. Um but you know, it's the sort of thing where if I just listened straight up to an unedited episode of one of our things, I probably would get bored with all of that extra chit chat. Especially because a lot of it's actually out of character and doesn't have anything to do with the game, um, and it's all stuff that we have fun with and we joke about when you're actually just at the table playing for fun. Um, before an actual production, um, it's not relevant at all. So let's talk about the approach to GMing that uh, Will Wheaton took. Mm-hmm. It was largely linear. Mm-hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, like I was saying earlier, I think I think it is a good thing for their show. They had a very specific story they were trying to tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, too, that because everyone involved, to some extent, did have experience with role play. Um, but my understanding also is that it's also experience with a lot of traditional role play. So right. they, they brought them on because they had improv acting experience. Um, but it's also they're used to cooperative storytelling in the sense that the GM basically leads you on this adventure and you sort of fill it with your character, if that makes sense. Whereas the type of the, the way we like to role play is that um, the adventure tends to be a lot more adaptive and the characters um, drive the action a little bit more than just sort of go along with the action, if that makes sense. That's certainly true, but there were... I'll, I'll refer to season one, which is entirely out of Roll With It, mm-hmm. um, the Eden program. We had beats. We had... Yeah, we definitely did. Five in... Let's call them um, small stories. Mm. If, if you refer to it as the A story arc, B mm-hmm. story arc, and C story arc, we definitely had a C story arc, which was the story arc for the season. Yeah. We had B story arcs, which were carried over from episode to episode. And then we had A story arcs, which were personal story arcs for mm-hmm. the characters mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the players. Um, but with that being said, I think that you know we, we planned to have a certain story be told in the season because you know now we are like they were um constrained to episodes of a particular length yep. for a certain number of episodes that's right um and so we did have to do a little bit more pre-planning so i definitely think that the style that they used works for the show 
yeah. even if it's not something that you know I personally like as a player I think I, I think I would enjoy being in a campaign like this oh very much um, so as a GM I don't think I'd enjoy running a campaign like this quite no so much. I wouldn't either I um, agree because I, I like being more ad libbed less planning um, letting the sort of letting the story sort of go wherever it needs to go yeah I find myself hitting mechanical walls with things like combat mm-hmm. which are very precisely done mm-hmm. um, one of my favorite systems of all is the burning wheel mm-hmm. um, by Luke Crane right but Whenever I get into combat at that, it, it, it starts to get muddy for me. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I actually rely on the players to remember their mechanics and just carry through on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually a strength, I think, of the uh, Fantasy Age system is that for the type of system it is, which is evocative of the traditional sort of like D&D, D20 sort of stuff, yeah. it is very simple, too. Um, it's got some very elegant mechanics. Um, it's not overly complicated. Mm-hmm. Um and so I think that it, it worked well yeah. um, for sort of being that in-between. So that's a good system. point. Of course, you know, even D&D has its iterations. Mm-hmm. Um, there was so much pushback on 4th uh, edition because it simplified down yeah. to one roll and one modifier. Mm-hmm. And it was like, ah, no, that's too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I'm reminded of actually a, a, a couple of web comics. And the first is The DM of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And the second is called Darths and Droids. And both of them are about these famous movies, uh, Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, as if they'd never existed Mm -hmm. as movies, but were instead a campaign that was being played by the players. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting contrast between those two for me is that the DM of the Rings, which came out first, Mm -hmm. is a very linear campaign. And it's about what happens when the players try to get off the rails Mm -hmm. and the GM snaps them back hard onto the rails. And then Darths and Droids came out after that and is still going on, technically. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for a number of years. They're doing all the movies. Mm -hmm. And well-timed, I would say, for (laughs) for Seven coming out. But um, they are actually... Their whole thing has been... the GM is completely adaptive Mm -hmm. and it talks more about what if you spend hours and hours creating this world Mm -hmm. and then the players never go there. They Mm -hmm. just never set foot on the planet because they went a different direction. Yeah. What I used to tell my students was if you have a binary choice of, do you go right down the hallway or left down the hallway? Somebody's going to want to break through the wall and go straight. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, those, those two comics when read together, uh, very interesting because it, it shows that railroad versus adaptive play. Mm-hmm. Um, again, right system, right group, mm-hmm. right story. Yeah. And the other way, reason that that worked, too, is, um, and we, we alluded to this earlier, the fact that um, Ryan Wheaton, Will's son, um, helped him develop the world. Yeah, co-writer. The story. Co-creator. And during the sessions, he would actually be taking notes on um, the sorts of choices players were making and that mm-hmm. sort of thing, and kind of what happened in the episodes. And so Will actually talked about this in their panel, where um, typically as the GM, he has a week to reflect on what happened in that session and where he wants to take it next. Um, he didn't have that luxury of time. It was basically play a three-hour session, take a 15-minute break, play another three-hour session. So he had Ryan there helping him by taking notes, and um, you know they like you and I did between episodes of Eden Program, they would confab and they would basically say, um, okay, so here's something I noticed. You can work this in, sort of tie some stuff together, and uh, maybe you can introduce this and that sort of stuff. So while they probably had a skeleton sort of fleshed out um, for most of the season, the episode-to-episode details um, were kind of co-managed by them. Yeah. And I think that was a really good, um, good idea on their part. Well, since we're talking about story Mm -hmm. and a pre-written story. I want to touch briefly on this idea of authenticity versus validity within the context of a narrative. Um, Basically, if you're talking about valid narrative, what you're talking about is uh, produced, Mm -hmm. pre-written, intended, and what we would probably consider to be modeled story. Mm -hmm. So if if you look at Joseph Campbell and the monomyth and you say, I'm going to write a story that fits that mold, Mm -hmm. that would be a highly valid Mm -hmm. story. We would say, um, the stuffy-headed academics would say, yes, that is a tried and true Mm -hmm. method of telling the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. You can almost almost take um, validity, if you want to sort of rephrase it a certain ways, almost um, credibility. Credibility, yeah. Um, The idea that you're going to assume that an author knows what they're doing when they are published 
and they have put out several other bestsellers before that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. That is a valid story. Whereas someone who just like hopped on the web and did a fan fiction is not quite as valid, right? A thing, but what they, they don't have that credibility. What they have in spades is called authenticity. Yep. And so this idea of being authentic um, might might be the difference between something that is heavily produced and something that is um, not heavily produced. It mm-hmm. might be the difference between having a very long play session which has it all in there mm-hmm. and something which is edited down. Right. But it can also be the difference between something that is a pre-written scenario and something that is entirely emergent. Mm-hmm. And so what... I found interesting about Titan's Grave is that it was a mix of that sort of narrative and ludic, mm-hmm. which was good. We had the authenticity of the I'm rolling a die, mm-hmm. the authenticity of a player's reaction to the situation, and mm-hmm. lots of what we call out of game content. Yeah. Um, but it also had a mix of um, the fight and the character moments. Mm-hmm. And so, all, while that is not necessarily. Um, authenticity versus validity what it is is a character moment is going to be something that's not Mm pre-written whereas a fight is pretty much going to be a pre-written moment there's a giant golem Mm -hmm. you are going to have to fight this statue and beat it and there's a specific amount of armor you have to get past Mm -hmm. a specific number of hit points you have to get past and once you've done that in an interactive way Mm -hmm. then we move on to the next thing and it's gated Mm -hmm. it's bottlenecked uh, whereas being in town and having a character interaction and through role play is going to be a much more authentic experience. Um, I don't know. Editing largely influences this. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're probably never going to see the stuff that was edited out, and mm-hmm. that's probably a good thing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the system was really, really good for that format. Um, but I'm wondering if it would have even worked for audio only. Yeah, because I I noticed there were a lot of times, um, and this is something that was another nice little bit about the production, um, high production values, the fact that they had uh, visual overlays of Mm -hmm, information. mm -hmm. They would, uh, every time someone was making a roll, it would pop up with, here's this character, here's what they're rolling for, Um, here is the actual dice they rolled, here is the modifier, and here is the total. Right. And so... In a way, it, it sounds simple, and it sounds like something you keep track of in your head, and yet when it's audio only, um, you're having to keep track of all those little details on your own. Um, you know, Even as quick as it is just to glance over and see what stat they're rolling for, if you don't have that reference, it's purely just in your head. It's like, what, what, what are they rolling for again? That sort of thing. Right. Um, and so in the visual medium, they have that luxury. Um, and I think that that um, is something that doesn't translate quite as well into audio. I think in audio... Um, because you only have the sound to engage you. Like, even in the visual thing, we could look at the players' faces and we could see how they're reacting to things. Right. Um, some of, like, the, the little visual gags, if you will, were, like, part of what made a lot of these moments um, funny and entertaining. Um, the faces they would make, you know, kind of when doing voices or um, kind of, like, the exasperated looks they would give whenever they rolled badly. <laughs> yeah. It's something that can come across in audio, but in audio, the only thing you have to engage you is the sound. That's right. And personally, for myself, I find that um, I'm much more engaged by things like character dialogue and interesting descriptions um, than I am by, uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and roll this stat, and uh, oh, I got um, one, two, three, uh, so plus two, that's five, uh, and that means what, and that whole thing, you know? Exactly. And that's why we trim a lot of that out and roll with it. Yes, yeah, just because it slows things down um, in a way that, you know, in audio, it, you can even if you could get away with it in video, we don't think we can do it in audio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the gorilla in the room. um, We got to kind of talk about it. (laughs) I think this is one of our biggest points of contention um, between the two of us. It's all been friendly up to this point, but now I'm putting my boxing gloves on. Um, (laughs) You should have trimmed your beard because I'm going to pull it. Oh boy. Um, (laughs) Episode nine. Episode nine. I I hated episode nine. Mm. Is that too strong of a word? I don't know. I think Kate might be a bit strong. Um, now, okay, so episode nine, uh, in case you need a refresher, is the one in which um, they're just about to go into the Tomb of the Prophet to do the big fight. Um, and they have basically a four separate sort of dream sequences, nightmare sequences, where uh, each of the characters kind of has a vision that strikes them as soon as they go through this portal. Um, and it is deeply personal to each of the characters um but also um it's like 10 to 15 minutes a piece of 
just like a dream sequence being described basically it was all um it was mostly scripted and it was essentially will is the gm um putting on i think it was a, a really good reading actually oh um, he with did some dramatic he certainly did um going through and reading these pre-written sequences that the players would occasionally have to make a choice or two um that were presented to them um but it is uh, as doc will i'm sure point out momentarily uh, a, a very big shift in narrative mode and yeah. it was a very big shift in presentation style and it takes um i'm kind of making your argument for you here by summing this excellent up. i'm glad uh, but it takes um basically what it is an interactive medium even though we are just watching the interactions it's taking what was even for them interactive and turning it into not so interactive now the reason i personally liked it was because um, I felt like it was something that was meant, maybe not entirely for the audience, meant almost more for the players. It was meant to get the players engaged um, it, with their own their own characters and to sort of be like put in their shoes and to, like you know you get at uh, watching this, watching the players react to it. Um, they were like very into these moments. Um, and like you could tell, especially like the well, all of them, but the actors especially, kind of like letting themselves get into character, um, visibly were reacting to this in interesting ways. They were. And so, I found it, it was something that I sort of found myself being like, "Oh man, I'd love to do this sometime in one of my campaigns." Mm -hmm. And so, sort of re relating to it as a GM and player in real life, and sort of identifying, like, sort of enjoying the. And I enjoyed watching the interaction between the players and the GM during these sequences. I agree. I, I found it to be, um, as, a, as my brother put it when we were watching it, it was, um, we're all going on a field trip, F-E-E-L. A field trip? Yeah. I like that. Um, because you, you felt the feels while you are watching this. <laughs> so um, in that sense, I thought it was very cool, but um, Will himself even acknowledges, and we'll probably get to his blog post about it here in a minute. Yeah, let's go ahead and um, read that, actually. Yeah, all right. So um, it, he, he says, now this is on willwheaton.net. Yep. And uh, he says, if you're not connected to the characters and want a lot of RPG action, this is going to leave you cold. But if I've accomplished what I always wanted to accomplish, you're invested in the characters at this point. If I've done what I wanted to do, you may not even notice that this is a story-heavy episode without a single die roll. If I've gotten you to come along on this journey with us the way I wanted to, this will be an emotional episode. For you like it was for us. And so I think that basically, and me at least, he accomplished what he set out to accomplish. He he went into this, he, he said himself that he expected it to be polarizing. Yeah. Um, and that's why he even wrote the thing about, like, if you're into the action, you're not going to like this episode. Um, or rather, if you're not invested in the characters. Yeah, um, I was going to say that yeah. there's a big difference there because yeah. I wasn't necessarily into the action. Mm -hmm. um, I was happy to... Um, when, on the rewatching, because mm -hmm. because we watched every episode more than once, mm -hmm. um, but on the rewatching, I was happy to fast forward through some of the fights because I knew how they came out and I mm -hmm. didn't really care about the roles. But what I was very interested in, invested in, was the characterization. Mm -hmm. My fear when I watched Nine the, immediately after watching Nine, and of course, half the fun of the show being produced and released is having a week to wait mm -hmm. half the fun is waiting you, i don't agree you with can't that, but. <laughs> you can't bin, well you can't binge it and that's mm -hmm. the point mm -hmm. um so i enjoy that aspect personally but then you know i'm a gen xer so um <laughs> that's how we were raised yeah. uh, but the, the point is this that when you've got that that moment at the end of nine where you're going okay what was the significance of that mm -hmm. why did all of that matter and, and that that's why I argue that I think that it might be, in a sense, more for the players than it was for us, the audience. Yeah. Because it mattered deeply to the players. But that's the problem, is because of that narrative mode shift, mm -hmm. that is to say, um, what we all in sixth grade learned of as point of view, mm -hmm. um, it shifted from that you, 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 and being personal into a they, they, they. Mm -hmm. And... It was too long. Mm. It was too much. 50 mm. minutes of it was just too much mm -hmm. of completely binary choices. Do you take the left mm. or do you take the right? Mm. Especially when I felt like they might have been false choices mm. and that nothing they did mechanically mattered because it was a flippin' dream sequence. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that I had mm. with it. And that's, that's a good point, but it's also an interesting thing. Again, coming back to my for the player argument... Um, that false choices may, given to a player 
aren't false choices. They are actually very meaningful choices. Well, like the, that's true. The, there's even a part in episode 10 where they're debating, do you take the left door or the right door? Or the left path or the right, right path? And they spend a couple of minutes talking about why they think that the right path is probably a trap. When, in fact, Will probably just figured either one they take, they're going to get to the same place. Yeah. But because you present them with a choice, they've got to think through a choice. And the very act of thinking through that choice um, creates a sense of investment and it creates, um, it makes you think about um, what you want, what you believe, what you intend to do, and why. It heightens the dramatic tension. Yeah. Yeah, and that's very true. I guess what I'm saying is that when I watched the intro for season 10 and it had the little 30 second previously on mm-hmm. Titan's grave. Honestly, I got more out of that previously on mm-hmm. than I did watching the entire episode nine. The, the, Will earlier in his blog post actually said, um, this was originally part of chapter 10 and in the book, it's pretty much something like, and I think by the book, they mean the adventure book. That right. The one they write. Um, it's pretty much something like the PCs and uh, the PCs endure nightmarish visions and have to make a save roll. And that was basically the episode. Yeah. Um, he said, I was ready to do that, but my son and co-creator Ryan realized that I had inadvertently paid off some important character moments and goals way back in Chapter 5 when they got the staff. Um, that was another time when they each touched the staff and they right. had their quick vision. Um, Which I have found very compelling. Yeah. Because um, it didn't take you know, 15 minutes a piece across the That's right. episode, right? Um, I didn't see what he was talking about until we got to the end of Chapter 8. We filmed 7, 8, and the original 9 on the same day. And that's when I knew I had messed up some really important stuff that affected the narrative character arcs for most of the players. The and original so, nine. Yeah, which oh. we, we, I'm curious if we'll ever see. I kind of doubt that we will. Yeah, I doubt it. Um, but that being said, it's interesting, too, to consider the fact that this was, in a sense, a, a Band-Aid. Um, it they, was. They scripted something to basically bring everything back it together. It was a reshoot. It, <laughs> yeah. was a, it was pickups. I mean, it, and this maybe, maybe that just came through a little bit. Mm. I got the impression that the... The actors were very, very tired and very, um, they were almost suffering through that moment. And I'm wondering if it's because they were told in a, in a completely out of game meta sense off camera, I'm sorry, I've messed up. Everything you just did was wrong. I never should have allowed you to do that. I don't think that was the case. I don't think that was the case because he went back and wrote that whole 50 minutes worth of narrative that night. And then they came back the next day and shot that. Well, that's true. That's so a good perhaps point. in a sense, the fact that they're rewinding, I, I didn't get that impression at all. I didn't think that they were tired of anything. I thought that they were all um, very much um, invested in this moment and like kind of putting themselves through this sort of like second person experiences of like you walk through this door and then this thing happens and all this different stuff. Like they were, yeah. they were trying to process it. And I thought that that was, I'd love to hear some comments on that and read some comments on the blog. So, mm-hmm. um, if, if you have a reaction to that, to episode nine, we'd love to hear your reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I'll let, I'll let go of your beard now. Thank you for being <laughs> so, um, uh, plastic. <laughs> But ultimately, I think um, that narrative mode shift is the reason why I, I'll back off from the word hate. Hate mm-hmm. is a strong word. It <laughs> leads to, to suffering in the dark side. Yes. Um, did not enjoy that episode. And when I do inevitably go back and watch the entire series and binge it from start mm-hmm. to finish, I will be skipping episode 9 mm-hmm. because the summary in episode 10 does it justice. That's fair. Um, and I think that when I inevitably go back and watch it, I probably will rewatch Nine. Um, although I'll probably also be thinking about sit, having seen it once, um, you know, and enjoying it when I first saw it too. But I can definitely see the argument for like it kind of, it, it might drag a bit. And so I almost wonder if there's some way that you can sort of re edit a few things in a way that you're able to get some of these, um, these dream sequences and maybe even abridged versions of them. Um, throughout the rest of the narrative so it's not such a giant chunk of we're not doing any rolling that yeah. sort of thing and you know if that if, if the various sequences had, had been believable action so it was confusing as to whether or not it was reality or mm-hmm. not I might have bought into it better but mm-hmm. things kept morphing from one thing to another it mm-hmm. was clearly a dream sequence mm-hmm. from the very beginning and I think the most meaningful choice was the first one from that point on, it was like, now we'll move to character two, mm-hmm. and you have choices as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, and now we'll move to character three, and you have choices as well. Mm-hmm. By that point, it was just variations on a theme. It was it was hitting that same beat over and over and over. Mm-hmm. 
and over. <laughs> and so had it been more like, I'm not going to tell you if this was real or not. Mm -hmm. Now we'll move over here. Wait, but did I just kill my father? What happened? Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, was, was this, was this time travel? Was it a, a, a flashback? Was mm -hmm. this, I don't understand what, what's going on. That could have been a lot more interesting to me with just that slight shift. Mm -hmm. And I think the real moral is don't do your writing at two in the morning. Uh. I oh, know. I thought it was good, <laughs> <laughs> but this is just the point. Where I guess you and I are going to disagree. I with think it, though, so. I, that's okay. Uh, well, let's talk about season two. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some reckless, reckless speculation or um, the the setup for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a mild problem with the way that it ended, in the sense that uh, it felt like it felt a bit abrupt to me. Yeah, you know, like it, it was the. You defeated the prophet, and then there's the twist of, oh, guess what? You just unleashed evil upon the world. Uh -huh. But then it ended immediately. Well, and, and I think, I forget which character it was that said it, but it was like, where's the loot? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's got to be there's gotta be loot at the end of the adventure, right? Which I don't mind that there isn't um, necessarily, because I, I think that in a lot of ways this kind of does break away from... Um, it is. It, it reminds you of the tropes of D and D and stuff mm -hmm. like that, um, and then kind of twists those in a way that I think is quite cool. Um, so, but yeah, you know, even the fact that the answer to the question, "Well, is there any loot?" doesn't get a chance to be answered. You know, I almost feel like it might have taken too long, and maybe it almost would have need to be another episode that might then have come across as unnecessary. Right. Um, but like, what do they do immediately after finding this out? You know, yeah. But of course, then it doesn't feel as cliffhangery as it would if it was, say, a TV show. Which you know, there is, there is, you do get a sense that to a certain degree, they were trying to deliver a narrative that had certain similarities to a scripted, presented sort of narrative, like say a TV show. Right. That's a good point. Um, but you know, they treated it like a big announcement. There will be a season two. Mm. They had to have known there would be a season two from the very beginning. Mm. Or, or else they wouldn't have written it the way they wrote it. So, that's to me, on one hand, it's good marketing, but mm. on another hand, it's a little bit tricky. Mm. Um, you almost feel like you manipulative. want... You want kind of like, even if there is something that definitely lends itself to there is going to be another season, something that still feels like it's a... a con there is a conclusion to something. Yes. Um, there is a... Uh, what's what I'm looking for? Um... Well, conflict there, resolution. There's there's a, there's some sense of closure to something right. at the end of the story. And again, that gets back to the A, B, and C story arcs. Mm -hmm. We did not have closure on our C story arc, but mm -hmm. we had some closure on the A story arcs of the individual characters. Mm -hmm. So I, I could see that being um, worthwhile. I don't know. Um, I'm really looking forward to season two. I Same think here. that it's, it's going to be fantastic. Um, it's going to feel like way too long to wait. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that all the characters return, mm -hmm. or I should say all the actors. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe maybe they won't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I'll say, too, that um, you know, some, uh, we talked before episode 10 came out um, yeah, about you know, knowing that they had announced, I think it was a Gen Con or something like that. Maybe it wasn't Gen Con, I forget mm -hmm. exactly. But at some con, there was a panel where they did confirm that there was going to be a season two yeah. before episode 10 came out. And so you and I, I think, were talking, and I was saying that I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of the idea of this adventure ending. They go and defeat the prophet, and then um, season two is just the further adventures of these same characters. Yeah. I would have almost wanted it to be... Um, because, like, there, there's something, and that's another sort of weird conceit of role-playing games, especially long-form campaigns, where um, you have these heroes who do, like, this amazing world-changing thing. Like, what do you do after that? You know, either the next thing has to go way above and beyond you it, go to or... Disneyland. Yeah, there you go. Um, either the next thing has to be way above and beyond. It's the old, uh, we're out of ideas, let's take it to space. Yeah. Thing. The world needs saving again. Yeah. Who are we going to call? Yeah, exactly. Um, or it's just, it's an adventure that... While it might feel important and big and stuff like that, doesn't have the same sort of impact as like the thing that sort of made them famous, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, but what this does is it allows that same adventure to continue without it feeling like it's just, um, well, these uh, people changed the world by finally defeating the Prophet Dewan and ridding a great evil and preventing the coming calamity. Um, so what are they going to do now? You know, yeah. and again, um, they're going to Disney World. You know? yeah, it's like, now they're going to have to clean up their mess. Is yeah. what they're going to have to do. Yeah, that too, I suppose. Um, but. I would actually like, and, and, and I don't know if um, you you don't like this trope. Mm. I know you don't, but mm. I would actually like for them to go back into the history more. Mm. Talk about the ancient heroes. Talk about I would that be, sort of thing. I would be cool with that if it is. 
those same actors, for instance, playing their ancestors. Playing their ancestors, yeah. I don't like the idea if it's literally going through a time portal and, like, seeing their ancestors. See, I think that's fantastic. Mm. I, actually, I'd, I'd love it if they were their own ancestors. It, uh, they, you know, they went back in time, and, and it turns out that they were their own grandpas or something. Uh, oh, I, Futurama stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd be totally uh, fine with that, is that they were the ones... Yeah, and we're talking we're talking season five here or something mm-hmm. like that. But they were the ones who put her away in the first place uh, as their own ancestors, that kind of a thing. I have to say though, th- this was one thing that confused me at first, mm-hmm. and I, I I wonder if it's the result of a narrative change that was made. Mm-hmm. But because family was such a strong theme in the series, I felt like the parents, the mm-hmm. direct parents, you know, the brother, the, in other words, the immediate family. Mm-hmm. And the ancestor element got a little conflated. Mm. Um, whenever the visions first appeared in the final episode, in episode 10, I actually expected that to be their ancestors. And it ended up not. No, mm. it's just a repeat. It's your dad again. Mm. And it's your mom again. You and, see, actually, and I was like, oh. It would have been interesting, I think. And I, I think I said this, too, when we were um, watching it before we got started to refresh ourselves. That... Um, it would have been kind of cool if instead of being visions, they actually were them. Yeah. Like, you know, when you, and of course they had the funeral for uh, Slutsk's brother, but you know, say maybe that didn't happen or um, maybe it was a body double or something. Sure. Yeah. Um, where it turns out that no, actually like these people are all here and they're actually your family and they're actually trying to stop you. Um, perhaps because like their ancestors knew, um, which is like one of the reveals that mm-hmm. um, you have after they defeat the prophet is that um, they imprisoned her and kept her alive artificially and implicitly because if she died, she would, you know, the, be the, reborn. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and so, you know, they might've had, you know, if not maybe their direct, um, their parents and siblings and whatnot, um, maybe even if it was their ancestors who were yeah. also artificially kept alive, this sealed long. themselves away in there. Um, like and the, were the final guardians to keep them from defeating the prophet. Now, of course, then at that point, there was probably going to be a, a conversation that happens like, okay, guys, listen, you don't want to kill the prophet. Right. <laughs> but so, you know, and it's one of those things where you kind of like, you have to do narratively whatever it takes to make sure that what needs to happen but happens. But that could totally work. Because if, mm-hmm. if they were like, no, this is a vision mm-hmm. trying to convince me mm-hmm. that we shouldn't kill the prophet. Mm-hmm. And then it turns out it Because wasn't. they've had all these visions that are screwing with them this right. whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And so she was doing that on purpose to mm-hmm. set them up for it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Will, uh, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, take note and uh, Ryan too. And, uh, you know, for for season three or four or maybe even five, uh, we're available. So just give us a call. Uh, contact information is available on our website, and <laughs> we are on Twitter. There you go. So um, I guess we might as well go and just like real quick close though with just sort of final thoughts, if you have any. Uh, if you have not watched Titan's Grave, you need to go do it. It's well worth watching the nine really good episodes that were... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The ten episodes uh, that were uh, released. I think that it's a fantastic, heavily produced take on roleplay. I hope to see more of that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. I think that Kickstarter money was well spent. Yep. And um, I think it was technically Indiegogo. But that's not, oh, was it? That's neither here nor there. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, crowdfunding. <laughs> it was crowdfunded. Crowdfunded. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, I definitely enjoyed it quite a bit myself. Um, I think it is a great introduction to role play, um, for people who aren't familiar with it. And I also found too that, um, you know, there, Will Wheaton also did a series of, uh, quick little tid- or quick segments on the Mary Sue that I'd actually recommend checking out as well, where he gives, um, a weekly GM tip. Yeah, tips. Um, and I actually think that he and I see eye to eye on a lot of things as when it comes to how you present your narratives and stuff like that, the role playing games. Um, I think that it is a series that for newcomers um, can introduce role playing in a really cool way. Mm-hmm. I think for um, veterans like us, um, it can teach you how to be a better player in GM. Um, so I definitely think it's worth watching, and I, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to season two. Agreed, agreed. So to everyone involved, uh, we've said this before, but awesome job. Um, it was just a really well put together show. Yep, I think that it represents a new chapter in produced RPGs. And with that, I think it's about time for us to wrap it up. Yep. So thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, codex entry about um, a critical analysis of Titan's Grave, the Ashes of Volcana. Um, once again, if you want to check out the show, you can check them out on YouTube. The channel is Geek and Sundry or uh, geekandsundry.com. Yep. And stay tuned on our channel for up and coming, uh, well informed and learned from <laughs> episodes of Roll With It. Bye. Bye, guys.